Welcome to Rise Up with Rebecca Seawright on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm your host, Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright, serving the Upper East Side, Yorkville, and Roosevelt Island. Local history is the topic today, with my two fascinating guests as our guides. Howard Tisch has a wide-ranging background in business, civic, and social interest, and has participated actively in New York and nationwide. He has supported a variety of women's, environmental, intergroup relations, and voter participation causes. In 1932, Howard Teach is going to talk to us about uh, a Central Park Memorial Grove of 24 trees and a flagstaff opened in tribute to American women who died overseas during World War I. Over time, memory faded of these heroic women and others who served. Today, this grove almost lost its history, and it remains the only memorial tribute in Manhattan to women veterans. So, Howard, welcome to Rise Up. It was very exciting. You and I, as you know, we co-chaired the uh, East Side World War I Centennial, and out of our interest in that, that came out of the York Avenue naming after Sergeant Alvin York, uh, we, we, we discovered that right here in our backyard was a, a, a lost piece of uh, history. And, and as you described it, it was the overseas women's uh, flagstaff and grove. And a wonderful thing from 69th to 71st Street along Fifth Avenue uh, that uh, who, as you know, couldn't really serve in the army in World War I. They weren't allowed in. So they went over and, and it most, mostly healthcare workers and were recognized when they came back by New York. And, and to show the significance of, of what we found, actually, because of trees, uh, in a way, and they had this ceremony. And um, thanks to an article that we found from 1932, the New York Times, uh, thanks actually to Kevin Fitzpatrick, um, who had a book on World War I and had a quick note on this. Uh, they planted two trees and had a ceremony with about 800 people. So we had the idea, if they did that then, that we should continue with the tradition. Uh, we started that again three years ago. We had two amazing uh, events at, at that time. And, and this year, fortunately, We've even, we even changed it and, and not only had people speaking, but we actually honored people um, who were either in the military or were on the front lines in terms of uniform services, women who were doing that. Now, of course, we've had change and transition, obviously, in, in, in the military and other places. As you look back 100 years, it's a real leap for women in terms of participation. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of having one of only a handful really in the nation um, of, of sites that are recognizing women of service is something extraordinary for New York. And our hope in the future, obviously, is that people, tourists and others, women who've, who've served, um, will come and use that site for purposes of just recognizing who they are, what they are, and what women have done in serving our country. Well, thank you, Howard. And um, this is such a, uh, a, a wonderful tribute uh, to our women veterans. And um, so you said that you mentioned Kevin Fitzpatrick mentioned in his book on World War I, um, this grove. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? There was, I believe, a New York Times article outlining this tribute and it had all but basically been forgotten. Um, until Howard, you uh, instituted this committee to, to come up with uh, remembering this grove of trees and women veterans. And I think it's so important that, that we pay tribute. So um, Howard, can you tell us a little bit more about that article that appeared in the New York Times and, and the reference in Kevin Fitzpatrick's book? 
Yeah, the reference was brief, actually, and it, and and just mentioned the fact that it was there. But it, but in terms of anybody recognizing it was there, it was lost. The Overseas Service League, candidly, we haven't even been able to get in touch with. Um, the 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 importance of this, the Red Cross was part of it, and in fact, with World War II, um, they changed the base of the flag staff to add the Red Cross as as participants in in this flag staff and grow. Um, we do, we've done and we continue to do each year with them and the New York City Office of Veterans Affairs, um, uh, a, a major participation, of course, the uh, Italian Foundation um, to a, a large extent and, and, of course, reached out in, in, in variety of ways to the Conservancy and Parks Department and all the others. Um, the article from 32 really gave us the sense of what this was all about. Um, it described it, it described the people who came to it, the women, it was the most distinguished crowd, including the mayor at the time. Um, and, and it's the only article we've actually found. We haven't been able to track this further. We don't know how long the ceremonies took place until what years. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're going to need to do in future years, of course, is pay more and more attention to this uh, site, uh, improve parts of it, you know, maybe some reseeding and other things to bring it back. But it's, it's gorgeous. It has a, uh, a lawn, which is what we had the, uh, um, over the three years. We had it at the flagstaff and, and on the lawn, the ceremonies. Um, there's a garden and with poppies and other things that'll again come back to its glory. Um, but it's an important part. Think about what that is along Fifth Avenue. They have two blocks worth of, of beautiful trees and, 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 and lawn uh, is, is a wonderful representation of what it means uh, to have been of service and, and, and to be remembered forever. Well, thank you, Howard and I. And uh, encourage everyone to, to go and visit it. Howard, you've done such phenomenal work here on the Upper East Side and uh, dedicated, as you said, the World War I Centennial Commission and the Sunrise Service that was recently in Carl Schurz Park for 9-11 and other initiatives. And we thank you so much for coming on today and sharing with our viewers about this historical tribute in Central Park to our women well, veterans. So thank you. Fortunate to have you as a co-chair on this, Rebecca. I couldn't think think of anybody who's more concerned about community and and tradition. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to all of our viewers for tuning in. We're going to continue on our journey of history today uh, with Kathy Jolowitz, the Yorkville Klein Duchlan historian. She's been keeping the heritage of Yorkville alive through exhibits and lectures covering the 17th century through the 1960s. Kathy was born and raised and schooled here in Yorkville. Her parents are from Germany and in 1932, as a community leader, she started uh, founding a member of the 19th Precinct Community Council and the 16th Block East 83rd Street Block Association, both in 1973. She is also a director of the German American Committee of New York and a division marshal in the German American Steuben Day Parade, which I attended earlier this year. And if you haven't attended the Steuben Day Parade, I encourage all of you to go. So welcome, welcome to Rise Up, Kathy. We're so pleased to have you join us today. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanna lead off with a few questions. Many German immigrants here in New York originally settled in the Lower East Side uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But how did the transition occur where Yorkville began to be more popular uh, as a residential area for Germans in the United States? Uh, well, in the 1800s, it was said that about one third of the city's population was of Ger uh, well, German uh, uh, immigrants. And um, they built their own en enclave in uh, uh, on, low, on the Lower East Side, and it was the original Klein Deutschland. And um, 
that there they had their own, um, actually their entire village. They didn't even have to go out into the city. So they had their own um, business people. They had their own uh, craftsmen. They had their teachers and their whole life was built in that little enclave. But in 1904, um, this on uh, June, June 15th, 1904, the Slocum da disaster occurred. And there, they, uh, 146, 1,046 people boarded the, Slo the General Slocum. And uh, by off the shores, by 10 o'clock, was about 9 o'clock, about 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, off the shores of Yorkville, uh, 1,026 um, men, women, and children perished in the Slocum disaster. So when there were no telephones or communication systems that we have today. So um, people were coming uh, to one spot in, in one church. It was St. Mark's Church, um, which was at 123 uh, East 6th Street. And that was a depot. And people would didn't know who, who uh, survived and who uh, were per had perished. And so those who had survived um, men came home to their homes and they found that there was um, one, one gentleman lost nine members of his family. So it was kind of a ghost town for these people. And Yorkville at that time uh, was developing. There were industries along the river. There were um, cigar factories and bakeries and breweries. And then the villas that were, that were uh, being built, they needed, they needed household people. I mean, it's not like today where you throw things in a washing machine. One person ironed, one person sewed, um, one person washed, one person washed, uh, cleaned the horses, one person shooed them. So there was a lot of uh, opportunity up here. So they started to migrate. And that was, and that was really the beginning of Yorkville Klein Deutschland. So there are really two Klein Deutschlands. Um, so in, um, yeah, then after 1904, the developers started to build housing for them and a little bit better housing, tenement housing. So um, that was really the, the seed for Yorkville Klein Deutschland. Very, very interesting uh, to preserve this history and to know about it and to understand the struggles that got us to today. In your writing, Kathy, you discuss how the community was full of diverse populations. Could you talk about how these diverse uh, groups of people interacted with each other and how they formed a cohesive community within Yorkville here on the Upper East Side? Uh, yes, well, you know, during that time, there was still existing the Prussian Empire, and the Prussian Empire were, were, consisted all of Eastern and Middle European um, uh, populations, and they all settled up in Yorkville, but um, the reason why Yorkville was named Little Germany at the time was because the common language of all these uh, in Middle and Eastern Europeans uh, was not English, it was German and being under the Prussian Empire. Then in the 50s, it became Russian, you know, so then the refugees that came here with their, their main language was Russian. Um, but um, these um, people all came together. The hub of Yorkville Klein Deutschland was 86th Street, which was between 3rd and 2nd Avenue. That was really the German Boulevard. But these uh, different uh, groups that came here, they formed their own boulevard. 72nd Street was the Bohemian Boulevard. Uh, 79th Street was the Austro-Hungarian Boulevard. And then 86th Street was the German Boulevard. But then there were little side streets and avenues. And 2nd Avenue was more, um, they called it Goulash Boulevard. Um, 86th Street was called Sauerkraut Boulevard. So it all had its own identity. Uh, there were small other en enclaves east of 2nd Avenue or more um, the Irish uh, population. Uh, farther, farther east on Avenue A, which is now York, uh, York Avenue. Uh, that was kind of a Russian enclave. And then north of 86th Street were little, little enclaves, like there was a Jewish section where the Marx Brothers, you know, grew up. And that was 179th 
East 93rd Street, I believe. And, um, and they have written a biography about their life in Yorkville. So, and then there were little Greek enclaves, Puerto Ricans who were in the little 90s. And we, everybody came together on 86th Street. I mean, there were, their whole life was centered on there. Wonderful. And how did they combat discrimination? I've heard stories of them changing their names, and um, but lessons that we still need to, uh, you know, talk about today in terms of discrimination. Um, can you just address that with the German people here in Yorkville back in the day? Yes. Well, it, it actually started in World War One. Um, uh, the Germans were so viciously hated. Uh, because of the of the uh, the controversy in, um, in in Germany, and so of course Germans and German Americans who were living here in the United States were um, were pretty much scorned, and so a lot of the, a lot of Germans uh, and German Americans then changed their names. I mean, I have a very good friend. His name is. His last name is Williams, but his real name was Wilhelm. But in uh, about 1919, a group of um, Germans came together and formed the, uh, the Steuben Society of America, where they declared they all declared their patriotism for the United States, and they were Americans. So there were um, um, enclaves all over the United States, clubs belonging to this society, with the headquarters here in New York and it still exists today. So um, then in World War II, World War II, of course, was also very, um, very uh, uh, unpopular and a lot of Germans were uh, discriminated against. I mean, things that were being done to Germans and the and Germans here in, in the United States would never have been allowed today. For example, I, at one of my exhibit lectures, I had people come up and talk to uh, tell their experience and one elderly gentleman came up and, and he, ex he told a story that he, his mother and his aunt were walking on 86th Street just speaking German. Of course, everybody was in those days were wearing dirndls and lederhosen. I mean, it was a big atmosphere here. And they, this woman heard these two ladies speak German and she came up and slapped his mother in the face. Mm. And that would not have been allowed today. So um, discrimination against the Germans was very heavy, but, and, but nobody really realizes that one third of the uh, American army were, were soldiers of German descent. And it was very difficult for these people who came to find freedom and, and peace here in this country. Um, their children were born here and they became German American, they became Americans. So they were fighting in the war against their own people. So it was very difficult for them. And what work is the Yorkville uh, Klein Dutchland Historical Society currently doing to keep the history alive of Yorkville? Uh, so that um, I know you have an exhibit uh, that, that you do with your lecture, um, but, but what are some things that the Historical Society is doing to keep this history alive? Well, I mean, basically, um, um, Yorkville Klein Deutschland is, is gone now forever. Um, I watched my village being dis dismantled brick by brick. I mean, all the dance halls and all the uh, restaurants and the atmosphere and the clubs and whatever they, you know, created, it's, it would be like you, you would wipe out Chinatown and just build big box uh, um, stores and, and, and high rises and it would be completely wiped out. So there is really nothing much we can do. So it, it's really gone. There's only two establishments left and uh, everybody comes for that. But um, the only thing we can do now is for, for um, I try to keep it alive with my German language learning club um, we're 32 years old now. And then my exhibit lectures are, um, you know, it's I have 36 panels and artifacts of all uh, what, what life was then. And no, there's a lot of books are written about Klein Deutschland, but that's just a smidgen of what I, what I have. And I think I'm just a one man army trying to keep this, this era alive. Unfortunately, there were no preservation groups in. So uh, Klein, Yorkville Klein Deutschland is 
really the lost era. And if anybody would like me to come and present, it's quite a big production. I need a lot of space, but I do it for free. And, um, you know, I welcome, I'm working on a book on it. It's uh, quite elaborate and quite detailed. So um, I really, my, my goal now is to keep the heritage of Yorkville Klein Deutschland alive. And, um, and I need all the help I can get to do that. Well, thank you, Kathy. And we are um, so willing to share how to reach you to our viewers, or they can call our office at 212-288-4607. Um, I think there's so many senior groups and school groups out there that would benefit from, Kathy, hearing your presentation. And uh, so we're happy have, to make that connection. I have a website, um, if you'd like to. It's, are there two, two addresses? Yorkville Klein Deutschland Historical Society uh, dot com. And then there's uh, the abbreviation YKHS NY dot org. Well, that is just terrific. And um, again, we thank you so much. It's been a real treat to hear about Yorkville and its history from you, Kathy. And unfortunately, we're nearly out of time. But again, I want to thank you for your very informative presentation. So Kathy, I, I have a quick question. Why is it so important that we remember this history, that we understand it, and that we're educated about it? Uh, for the future and for future generations? Well, I mean, a perfect example of that, I, I get the requests from preservation groups all the time to give their support to their goals. And uh, just recently, actually, two days ago, um, I sent a letter to uh, Village Preservation and uh, the, where the west part of, of, um, of a Lower East Side meets the West Village below, the, the section below, uh, the Union Square has not been de declared an historic district. And it's uh, also very famous because of its uh, roots in the German community. So um, I like to help them re uh, to, to bridge the gap between the West Village and the Lower East Side. So that's one thing that, you know, we can all support these preservation groups to do. Absolutely. And Howard, for you, why do why is it so important that we preserve this tree uh, grove in Central Park dedicated to women veterans? I think it goes to the larger issue, Rebecca, which is for those who are coming in now, and we know there are many new people who are constantly coming into the Upper East Side um, and, and young people, they don't know history. And in creating a village, which, and, and I've mentioned to you of, of what the Upper East Side really can be and is, um, the continuity of, of who we are, what's taken place here. Every building is, as Kathy talked about, you know, has its significance, every block. And, yeah. and we can learn more and more. And, and I think there's a way through new technology um, that we can really preserve all of this, bring it out to the community in bigger ways, have people literally go down the street, take out their mobile, and you can have little chips on the buildings, which, you know, with augmented reality will create what was there before. Um, so the opportunity of what we can do, and perhaps even getting some of the seniors and centers uh, involved in assisting us with us, I think everybody together can really making this a living, vibrant place, not only for the future, but enlivening the past. And Howard, you mentioned specifically, there's only one monument in Manhattan dedicated to women. What does this mean for young women uh, when they pass by the grove of trees in Central Park that are dedicated uh, to the women uh, from World War I? Well, I think we're talking about this one women's veterans monument. There, there are not enough women's monuments generally, but one veterans monument. I, I think, you know, in, in veterans, we have in a broader sense of uniformed healthcare workers. It's others who participate in so many ways. Um, I think what they take away from it and what they should take away is, is respectfulness for each other um, that we need more of in our society, I think. And, and you can see it in terms of going there, the contemplative part of being there, 
of thinking of all of these people over the years and into the future that will be serving each other and, and people they knew and others that they didn't know, but they just had this commitment to making a difference. I think that's what it's uh, to a large extent about and realizing it was really serious that these women uh, went over there and others have gone and put, a, put their lives on the line uh, to serve others. I think it's an important lesson and, and it can be messaged out from there. Well, thank you. And and I know down in lower Manhattan, I went with the Girl Scouts to the fearless girl statue that uh, is near Wall Street that used to be facing the bull. And so these statutes and monuments and history is just so important. Recently on Roosevelt Island, we had a ribbon cutting with FDR uh, extending his hand out from his wheelchair to a young girl with crutches. And so I think it's just so important that we understand our past and our history. And I wanna thank all of our viewers for tuning in today and, and both Kathy and Howard for joining us uh, with these important historical tributes and lessons that we can all benefit from. And I thank our viewers for tuning in. Uh, we, we're located on Yorkville and the Upper East Side on 79th Street, we're co your community office. And uh, we ask that you stay in touch about upcoming events. And thank you for tuning in today. First you go down and then you go and make it better